let's find a little bit of uh, organization here. Uh, it will be better if those of you who are in the back move a little bit closer. We can share the tables here. Can you see the screen from there? Yes. I really, okay. Well, you're welcome to move closer so you can see. Now, the, this cafe is in English. I hope everybody knows this. This will be given in English. Uh, if we speak too fast, please let us know so we can slow down a little bit and we can get our ideas through. Are we okay? Do we agree? Yes? Excellent. Good. Uh, so nobody's moving closer? Everyone wants to be far apart? So hopefully you don't miss the important part that is on the screen. Uh, you want it louder? I can get... This is louder. I, I just say I can get the mic closer. Can you hear me? Yes? Over there in the corner? Can you hear me? Yes? Can you hear me? Good. Perfect. Okay, welcome to the University of Eastern Finland Cafe Smart Science Cafe. What is this double? <laughs> so it's a Cafe Smart or Science Cafe Smart. This is, a, this is a privilege for us to be here and to have you participate in it. Um, this uh, cafe is part of the Suomi Sata project. It's our Finland's 100th anniversary. And it's based on the new prospects of technology and analytics and improving people's health. And we have the privilege to have Professor Karsten Karlberg with us from the School of Medicine and Professor Pasi Karjalainen from the Department of Applied Physics of the university. They both are going to share two very important things that relate to everyday life from a scientific approach. Uh, Professor Karsten Karlberg is going to share with us uh, disease preventive function of vitamin D. And Professor Pasi Karjalainen will share with us the possibilities of robotics in future rehabilitation. So uh, with no further ado, I would like to invite Professor Karsten Karlberg to share with us the disease preventive function of vitamin D. Yeah, thank you, Ricardo. Now, I next challenge how I get this to the screen. Here we are. So, next half an hour or so, we talk about vitamin D, my favorite topic. And are you sure you can see that? Or don't you consider coming closer just to get the details here? Uh, otherwise, you may miss some important points. So, first point I want to make to you, vitamin D. This is this molecule here. We can get in two major ways. The natural way to get vitamin D is to produce it in our skin. But for this, the skin has to be exposed to UV light. As you can guess, whole Finnish winter, no chance, only in the summer. Okay? So this is blocked in Finland and other Nordic countries the whole winter. And even in Central Europe, it's a major problem. Okay? So when you don't get it in this way, you have to take it up by diet. And the classical diet to get it is from fish. And I will give you a moment in, in a moment an explanation why from fish. Or also to some extent from mushrooms. But these mushrooms have to see UV. So if you keep mushrooms in the dark, they will never have vitamin D in them, okay? Or you take it by pills. That is the way, as most people do it here in Finland, 
And you also know milk is supplemented uh, uh, with vitamin D, but the amounts are not that high. Maybe just one way from where vitamin D comes. The precursor, which gets the UV light, comes from cholesterol biosynthesis. Cholesterol is evolutionarily a very old molecule, more than half a billion years old, so or a very simple organism. For example, the plankton in water has uh, this cholesterol synthesis, and also they produce vitamin D. But the plankton is not producing vitamin D for any strong bones. They don't have any bones. It's producing it purely as a sun shield. So saying by that, the production of vitamin D is evolutionary a very old process. And the prime function was as a sun shield. Now, vitamin D, once we have it here, is further converted in our body to a molecule called 25-hydroxy. There is one extra group added here to the molecule. And this is if you asked to get vitamin D measured in your blood, they measure this molecule because it's the most stable form of vitamin D. So the vitamin D status, you may be asked about am I high, am I low, yeah, is how much of this molecule you have in your blood. This molecule can be further converted by one extra hydroxy group. Now you So if you're eating fatty fish, you're basically eating the vitamin D which originally was produced in the plankton. Okay, so therefore fish is a reasonably good source of vitamin D. Okay, when life moved to, uh, uh, out of the water, suddenly the species were exposed to gravitation. Then they needed a strong skeleton. Like we have a skeleton and also uh, most other species on land have a skeleton. And for that you need calcium. And to get calcium into the body, to get it in the right amount, vitamin D was used or still is used as the critical hormone. So, number one, we need vitamin D for strong bones. And since we or our ancestors are on land, we using vitamin D as a hormone to control how much uh, calcium we get into our body and that we get strong bones. So vitamin D, bones, this is the first connection. Now going, continuing in evolution. You see here a nice scheme of different skin types that we have in humans. And you probably know that if you're looking for the original population in the different places of our world, we have around the equator rather dark skinned people and the more you get into the poles, uh, the more lighter the skin type is. So why do we have light skin? The modern human, the anatomically modern human started some 50,000 years, maybe 60,000 years to move out of Africa to what's north, to Asia and to Europe. And while moving, you became out of kind of equator region to region which is far less exposed to sun. So even southern Europe is in this sense pretty much north. Okay? And that gave an evolutionary pressure uh, to produce vitamin D despite the fact that initially the skin was dark. So 
in many generations, over 20 to 30,000 years, the skin got lighter and lighter. And if we are now looking here primarily in people with light skin, it's the result of some 50,000 years of evolution getting the skin lighter and lighter to be able to produce even rather in the north vitamin D. Okay? So, you have to expose your skin to, uh, to sun, otherwise you can't produce vitamin D. If you're afraid of sunburn, even sun, uh, skin cancer, you would have to take the pills or eat a lot of fish. So, I already spoke about vitamin D in bone. That is, I think, what everyone somehow knows. There is also vitamin D has importance in controlling cellular growth, so to some extent preventing cancer. But from my point of view, and also from the point of view of our research, the most important function of vitamin D is in the immune system. You may have heard about the immune system is split in two parts, the primitive called innate immune system and the more advanced version of the immune system called adaptive immune system. Both types of immune systems are controlled by vitamin D. So vitamin D is making sure that our immune system works fine, so that we are well protected against infection, that we are also protected against autoimmune diseases, allergies and things like that. So, in contrast, if you have a lot of infections, if you have suffer from autoimmune disease, if you have any type of problems where you say, this is my immune system not working fine, it could be that you may not have enough vitamin D. Okay? So there I see the major role of vitamin D. This is now really getting hardcore science and I don't want to uh, 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 speak over your heads, but just one point. This green stuff here is a protein which binds vitamin D. Yeah, and that protein directly binds to DNA. It functions like a switch, like a light switch. Okay, and there is not only one light switch. If you take a big building, there are hundreds, thousands of light switches in that one building. And you can, in that building, switch on light or uh, 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 and, and regulate light exposure in, in the building. So in a similar way, vitamin D, the stuff that we're taking up our diet or produce in, in our skin, is switching on kind of the light in our cells. And the light means genes. So I'm not sure if everyone knows what a gene is. Uh, this is the thing which is encoded inside our cells and tell our, tells our cells what to do and what not to do. But it's basically just the storage information. Yeah, it has to be told from outside when I do what. And vitamin D contributes to that, to tell basically our genes when to be active and when not. So if you ask me, what is really vitamin D doing? Controlling bone, controlling the immune system by putting the right light switch on at the right moment. Okay? So, if there is not enough vitamin D, nobody's touching the light switch, the room stays dark and you have some problems to orientate yourself, if you take that analogy. Okay? So, we can switch over this and jump to directly some concrete example. Also, this, you don't have to look any details what it means, just get a rough idea about the number of points that you see here. It's more than 500, and each point indicates a gene, an instruction that is under control of vitamin D. So we have altogether some, in our, uh, in our cells, some 20,000, and 500 and something uh, of these genes are responsive to vitamin D only in one immune cell. This is called a monocyte. And we have 400 different cells in our body, cells and tissues. So, it should just tell you there are, in one cell type, already 3 to 4% of all genes which are responding to vitamin D. That means that percentage of our body is somehow responsive to vitamin D. So I'm not saying vitamin D is doing everything. 
I'm saying vitamin D is contributing to maybe that percentage to a valve function of our body. And if your vitamin D is not optimal, yeah, then you're losing this control function, this percentage. So don't misunderstand. Vitamin D is not saving the life on itself. It is just contributing to our overall health. And one needs, of course, to take a number of other compounds under control. But this is the rough estimation, a rough percentage that vitamin D contributes to it. Now, this is measuring the vitamin D status of elderly people here in Finland. So 1,000 people uh, were measured once a month. And what it indicates here is the concentration of vitamin D in the blood. So where you see the dot, hopefully you see it, this is the average. The first uh, red horizontal line is the minimal amount one should have. And what you can see, most of the people are below this level just in July, when, of course, there's most sun, the people are above this lower minimal level. Okay? There are other people saying that you should have the level of 75 nanomolar, and if you take this as a reference, nobody really is in a good range. Okay? Here is the debate in the field now what one should take, but you already get the message most of the year uh, you are the average Finnish person, or at least the elderly, you're probably not going that much out, are in a too low range. Okay? So this is the risk. It means from the light switches, from the functional immune system on the bone, uh, these people are under risk to really developing problems or getting problems. So, and that is now unfortunately printed very small and you may not be able to read it. It's a longer list of, of diseases and malfunctions that could happen yeah, when vitamin D is uh, at low level. So, a longer list of things and maybe osteoporosis, muscle weakness, rickets, cancer, autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis are one of the top of the list. And now I want to make one extra point, and I try to make it simple. Not taking too much of your time. So we did, and it, I'm cutting now a longer story short, we did an investigation of 71 elderly people in Finland and classified them whether they well responding to vitamin D. We not only measured how much vitamin D they had, we gave them vitamin D for five months every day and looked how they responded to vitamin D, the whole Finnish winter. And we found that about one third of the people are very low responder. Uh, so they may have by numbers sufficient amount of vitamin D, but they did not respond well to it. While another third of the people or so, they are high responders. And in the middle we have the mid responders. So the point is, those persons who are low responders yeah, are under special risk you know, when they're not getting enough vitamin D, that the major function that vitamin D is mediating, so bone, immune function, you know, that this is not functioning well. So one needs to determine if you are high or low responder, and that is basically a test which needs two type of measurements. The vitamin D status, so giving once a blood sample and knowing how much you have in this moment, is the standard. This you may have already uh, done, some of you may know your vitamin D level. But what comes, and that is the new concept that we are proposing, we need to know in addition if you are high or low responder. But this one has to measure once. It's a property you have for the uh, whole life. So once you know you are a high responder, you can leave the room, vitamin D is no topic for you, even in Finland. You will get enough. But if you are a low responder, you should really take care that you get enough vitamin D. And that's about 25% of the population. And this is basically a property you need to know. Okay? So, just 
one of the last slides here. Yes. So the hypothesis that I base on that concept is vitamin D intervention studies or general supplementation that people will do and if they're helping and what type of level, you, what type of daily dose you should take should be in relation to what is your vitamin D response index or short vitamin D index. So if you know you have a low index, you would have to take more, a more personalized adapted dose. Now, and if you have a high vitamin D index, pretty low doses or even not taking anything and just living from what you produce yourself in the skin and get for milk or fish is sufficient. Okay, so we have to take special care on the low responders, but for that we have to basically screen the population to find out who is low responder. I just say one in four, so here in this room, 10, 15 people, but I can't tell you by looking into your face who is the low responder. We have to do some measurements. And I think that's the main message that I want to bring over. Thank you, Professor Kahlberg. Um, I think we can all agree that there is a level of relevancy on our dosage of vitamin D. I mean, lift up your hand. Who here takes vitamin D every day? Like every day, a pill of vitamin D, right? Almost everybody. I will say 70%. Well, I, I, if, you're, if your approach is right, one in four is low responder. I think we should become more aware where do we sit in the scale, in this index? I will open for a couple of questions. We uh, have limited time, but if the audience wants to participate with, I, I, will, I will give two questions, the opportunity. We have one, um, and if there's another one that arises, please, you can follow. I'm gonna take the mic this way. Thank you. Um, I didn't catch the first part of the talk, but maybe you uh, answered this question already, but, um, I'm kind of curious, uh, why, why is the Finnish uh, recommendation of the vitamin D, uh, the, the amount of vitamin D or the pre precursor in, in the blood is quite low. It's 70, I think it's like 70 micromoles per liter, if I don't, nanomoles, sorry, sorry, uh, slight difference. Uh, but then when you look at the population that lives in Central Europe, in Southern Europe, uh, their natural occurring um, amount in blood is 115 to 120 nanomoles per liter. So why is it that we are aiming to 70 and it seems that the natural amount is way more? So just to make the numbers correct, I think in, in Europe we are at best at 50 nanomolars, not higher. And that is the recommendation, the official recommendation, the same for the US, 50. If you're living here and being natural, Maasai or whatever, these people, they have about 120 to 150. But they're living under natural condition and living close to the equator, okay? So now you can have two different type of argumentation. These people have to live in the sunny place. And they get to this high level is the question if they really need that much, okay? Or if they have that much and just, just basically have their metabolism active to get rid of the extra vitamin D. That would be one possibility. The other point is, and I guess this is your argument, this is what we, where we started, and the natural population has this 120 nanomolar. Why should we not all in the whole world have 120 nanomolar? So this is now open for discussion. Yeah, I mean, I have colleagues who warn of uh, too high vitamin D levels, in particular coming from the U.S., and they say we should be uh, b uh, between 50 and 75, full stop, not higher. I personally would say until 150, everything is fine, but don't aim more than that. Yeah, so some people are really extreme and want to get 200. No, this is too much. 150, full stop. And above 100, everything is fine, for sure. Yeah? Yeah. 
Is there anybody else who would like to ask something? Yes. Um, Yoko, can you tell tell us who you are so he knows? Sir, yeah, I'm, my name is Yoko Savolana. I'm from the University of Pharmacy. So we, we deal with these questions every day, very, very much so. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Would you please tell us who you are? And yeah, my name is Tina. I come from Austria and we have the same problem in the winter months, but I'm curious about what happens if we overdose with uh, vitamin D. Thank you. Sorry. So there are a few cases of overdose of vitamin D, voluntarily or involuntarily. These people get some um, neurology uh, problems. Which, is, which are ob observed rather quickly, so then they visit a doctor and then probably it comes out. Yeah? And in the worst case, you get soft tissue calcification. But I haven't heard about any case recently that really people were taking vitamin D so long, ignored all other problems of overdosing. So from my point of view, I'm not a medical doctor, there is no serious risk of overdosing. I'd like to finish with this. Uh, professor, in your words, uh, what's the future of vitamin D? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Please give a hand to Professor Carlberg. Thanks. Now we have uh, the pleasure to have Professor Pasi Karjalainen from the Department of Applied Physics at the university, and he's going to introduce us into the possibilities of robotics in future rehabilitation. And we're gonna base the, uh, the examples that he's going to use are around the neurological rehabilitation subject. Professor. Okay. Do we need to, okay. Uh, do, we, do we need to have your yes. presentation up there? Okay, great. You can tell the joke. I, I can tell a joke, okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> a man walks into a bar. <laughs> a few people will understand that here. <laughs> okay, perfect. Cheers. Okay, hello. University of Eastern Finland, Department of Applied Physics. Don't ask me what is applied here. It is just physics, so it covers all the universe. So anyway, it is not so important. But. Um, I will talk about human motion analysis, robotics, main, mainly concentrating to neural rehabilitation, but I give a couple of examples uh, about ergonomics, just for giving idea what, what does it mean when we try to model human motion. It might sound very easy because uh, there is even toys nowadays, Xboxes and, and whatever my, my, my sons are playing every day. Uh, but what is different between some PlayStation or Xbox and, and serious motion analysis made by uh, medical devices and, and used in medical treatment or rehabilitation or whatever. So, but um, I give you first couple of ideas what does it mean when we really want to model motion on human biomechanical uh, things. So we have motion laboratory, actually we just have moved one week ago and everything is messed up and, and we will build new, new camera systems using uh, either we have six cameras or 26 cameras but I have not decided yet so it is still under work but <clears throat> we have used this about 10 years ago uh, Metos is most like uh, Walt Disney or some Hollywood uh, studios we can make measurements of human motion by cameras by using for example several maybe tens of cameras, dozens of cameras, so that we use reflectors in, in body and, and then 
take camera pictures, movies from different projections, and then calculate backwards what was that kinematic parameters of human body. So that is possible. Okay, it costs a little, not so much nowadays. It is a little complicated. You have to have those cameras. You have to take them wherever you go and, and that kind of things. A um, little more, okay, this is just, just for showing that that is what we try to do. A uh, little different uh, approach is to use so-called inertial, uh, inertial sensors. So you might know that, for example, in, in cars and, and nowadays very often in, in, in those drones, for example, which, which you can see flying all around, there is sensors that uh, very accurately um, take that motion of that very high or, or flying object. And they are used for, for steering of those devices. So those, those very small sensors nowadays, they are very accurate and they can be used also for motion analysis. So it is, again, a little complicated. You have to build a uh, network be between those sensors. You have to have electricity and you have to have connections and that way. But with those systems, you can make some mobile things also. You maybe need something like 20 sensors put around body, but you can make those um, measurements of kinematic parameters, mainly speed and, and acceleration and, and how your body parts are moving. But with both of these systems, that is, that is not the main problem, because if you just would be human without weight or without muscles and without fat and without bones, it would be nice. But human is is biomechanical device. So most important part of us with respect to motion, they are inside us. So we have to have very accurate uh, biomechanical model to get some meaningful ideas what really happens. So if we think that you have, for example, some problems in your joints, or you have some problems in your uh, maybe brain, you have had stroke, some neurological thing, your hand is paralyzed, the thing is not in, in that, that measuring of that motion, but giving meaningful idea what your body is doing. How this motion is related to your, to your bones, joints, muscles, and other organs. That is problem. And I will show you one thing first. Okay, I showed you this thing. This is done just by using 10 sensors. That time we didn't have 20 sensor systems, but this is done by using uh, those inertial sensors. So without cameras, just by measuring accelerators and, and that kind of things. Uh, this is our patient. It, it doesn't mean that he or she doesn't have any head or hands, but we just had 10 sensors, and we are interested in walking. This is a stroke patient, real, real patient in real rehabilitation center. We were treating him, and, and this is result uh, of measurement. So you, you can see even by us visually that there is something wrong in this, this walking. So if we think that we should use this, for example, if we need to make some decisions 
where that if that rehabilitation was successful or how you should proceed these are very very important parameters but by visual inspection you cannot see everything so for example in this case we would be interested in for example angles uh, let's say knee ankle and here you can see for example these are really reconstructed uh, steps you see that there is some some problem with your with your left one is okay but then right one is not so good and then here you have ankles angles of ankles angles of knees angles of your hip so you see that it is it is clearly they are different so your your walking is not normal you cannot expect that it would be normal ever okay after stroke but is, is it good enough should we continue rehabilitation or what should we do uh, here we mostly used uh, those parameters ankles and that kind of things but but when we need to calculate something else for example forces or some, some biomechanical things like for example when we want to move very heavy patient in hospital that is very he very hard job and 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 uh, it is um, for for nurses it is not so easy thing and and you have to have good technique to do that uh, and there is some devices which can help you so this is one thing we did we measured uh, traditional way is to use traditional equipments and then new equipment for doing this thing and and then we needed also this biomechanical model because we wanted to calculate forces and moments in your lumbar area so we had to make modif uh, modeling all those spines the whole spine all these um, things here to get idea for that and when we measured also forces with force plates under nurse then calculating backward we just could could calculate that force and moment there so this is just visualization of how it works uh, i didn't get any results but but you see that for getting idea what happens we need to have this kind of full model this cannot be done without modeling the whole bone whole skeleton so and i tell you that is most important and most that is hardest part of this this motion analysis so uh, this is another study of ergonomics uh, cleaning work and if you think that you are cleaning with with that device i don't know in english but in finnish that is moppy simply so that is cleaning device with stick stick and things but but you you can think that human shoulder is not not so easy to model because it is not just one uh any any one one joint but there is several joint the whole uh shoulder is moving and there is very many de degrees of freedom so you can imagine that this is not so easy part of human body to model and this is actually the topic you wanted me to talk so i, I have one and a half slides of that so actually uh one of very important topic in in future 
how to use um, motion analysis is to connect that to robotics. And one of my dreams is to build fully, fully functional robot technology for hand rehabilitation using robotics. So Clue is, is not in, in, in things that I would like to fire all physiotherapists in rehabilitation centers that is not important or, and that is not possible because problem in, in rehabilitation, neural rehabilitation especially, is that whether you go to basic health care in Finland or special health care, some rehabilitation, problem is that you don't get enough hours. So in, in basic health care you might get some half an hour and you wait 23 and a half hour per day just to get some rehabilitation. When you go to some special place you will get one hour rehabilitation. So if you can change it, if you can build uh, virtual me methods, re robotic methods and that kind of things so that robot can help you uh, just for making, for example, when you are starting, starting to um, give after stroke, brain injury, stroke uh, that can be infarct or, or bleeding of blood in brain, uh, you, you have several phases in rehabilitation. You have to start immediately as, as soon as possible. You have special things there. First, you have to give some exercise so that you, you, your hand wouldn't turn to be spastic. And, and after a while, you start to give some mirror therapy so that you can make, you, you will make larger movements. And for example, our plan is to make, make this kind of system that you can measure your your healthy side, your, make um, motion analysis of healthy side, your healthy side, healthy arm, and copy that with robotics to your infected side. So that is one effective rehabilitation mode. These kind of things, and, and if you can use this together with uh, traditional physiotherapist based um, rehabilitation, you will get just hours more for rehabilitation. And it will be economically very, very important thing in the future. Because that is one of the main problems in, in the whole Western world. And I would say that also other parts of the globe. But that is that is why why I am doing this. I want to see it happen. So I just made one example. This is this is Tora here. We don't use that guy, but I just wanted to show that with this inertial sensor here, I can easily by using few computers and few computing languages and 15 minutes computing and you can show how move this when when Sora is moving his hand my Kuka is moving his hand also and this is this will treat you after some years I think this is enough Thank you, Pasi. Um, now we'd like to give the opportunity to the audience to interact with Professor and his robotics approach to rehabilitation. Uh, is there any questions? Now we have time. Now we can discuss. Yes. Please tell us your name. Thank you. Okay. My name is uh, Ali uh, from uh, Social Science uh, Department, but uh, my background is occupational therapy as you know, rehabilitation science. Uh, and I worked uh, as occupational therapist a uh, couple of years. Mm, 
in, uh, especially in people who have a um, neurological condition like a stroke and something like that. But uh, usually we just focus on uh, active range of motion of people. Uh, but in your approach, as I uh, saw, um, is just focus on passive range of motion of some uh, movement in patient. So my question is, uh, is it alternative approach to rehabilitation, uh, as you mentioned, traditional rehabilitation, or as a supportive approach, and how these devices uh, can help and support that uh, uh, active rehabilitation as, as I experienced. Thank you. Yes, that is very good question and, and answer is very simple. It is, it is supportive. Not in any sense it is alternative. So everything those physiotherapists do is okay and right, but there is too much to do, too many patients and too less time. So that is why I think that first things we should give robots do is the simplest things. So if physiotherapist needs very much time, for example, for relaxing some hand before they can start even that, that rehabilitation task, that clever task. It takes time and it might sound waste of time because there might be another patient in the same room with whom you can make some remarkable things and some more clever things and, and that time robots can help the physiotherapist. So it is, it is for sure that is supportive. There's no problem for that, I see. Thank you, Basi, for the answer. Next question. Hi, uh, I'm Nico. My background is in international business. So here's a more uh, practical question about um, how are you going to make your dream come true? <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> I'm sure you know. So that is so easy question because that is only business. Uh, so I would say that business is only one way to make things happens. So, if I want to make this happen, uh, I need to see some need for that. Uh, some need is, I, I think very many people know knows that there is need because uh, especially older people like me, in my age there, I have several friends even who have had stroke in, before they are 50. So there is strong need and they all tell this same story that there is no time enough for them. They would like to do more but physiotherapists in hospitals, in basic healthcare, in, in neuro centers, they cannot give that time. So if there is need for that, there is also for sure, there is place for making business, for example. For example, Finnish healthcare, this nice sote thing. We all know that this is one of the best in the world, but it can be a little better. And I would say that it is not important thing who is doing things, but there is new things to do. And always when you can or arrange differently things, when you save some money, you can use that more clever. And this thing is just for doing things more clever. And when you can do clever things, it can be business. And of course, somebody takes this part and make that product 
somebody takes this part, make that product, then the whole system can be product. It can be done by society, it can be done by rehabilitation centers. I don't know if you know, but, but uh, in fact, big part of re rehabilitation is, is nowadays even in Finland, uh, it's not arranged by society, but they are, they are just foundations mostly and, and that kind of things. So business is not out of this. Thank you. There's two more questions here. Uh, Professor, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> directly you, to your topic. Um, you kind of selling, when it comes to the key keyword uh, business, a device which probably will cost a lot of money f in case of a disease that is fully preventable, or let's say to 90% preventable. Now, the very most people getting a stroke or getting a heart attack had an unhealthy lifestyle. So, if one would invest a small part of the money that your device would cost in proper education of the persons that they are doing the li healthy lifestyle, you would not have the cases. Okay, you, don't, you can't then sell your machines, yeah, but uh, the overall health would increase. So, my keyword is prevention and not investing a lot of money when people are getting ill. Of course, one has to help them, but the best invest investment is in prevention. Yes, I'm Nadia from University of Eastern Finland. And no question and no comments. I'm just here to share some of my experiences uh, that might give some ideas. I had uh, this opportunity to visit Toronto Rehabilitation Center. And, there, uh, and my topic is um, falling in the elderly risk factor and how to prevent falling risk in the elderly. So I have seen there uh, how they have integrated robotics and this uh, rehabilitation. For example, um, there is one robot or devices when a woman or man uh, elderly living home alone and if they have fallen, so they're, and they don't move for two minutes or one minute. So this device will automatically call the emergency center. So that will prevent the further consequences. So I just thought this might uh, give some ideas and um, it's not related to the therapist or physiotherapy, but um, I have seen how robotics has been integrated in other prevention as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Basi. Um, so we have gone through the, uh, this uh, evolutionary behavior of vitamin D. Thank you for those, uh, for those uh, important things that we got today. Uh, remember, status and index, very important. Index is your contribution, and we should all be aware. Uh, if we are low, is it low assimilators, uh, we are at risk, so we should have that in mind. And... Um, I would like to encourage everybody to take the university magazine. All the research and the investigations are uh, listed there. It's, a, it's free for you to take with you. I would like to, first of all, thank you for participating today with us. Uh, it's a great turnout. I, I'm very uh, happy to help you. Um, I want to introduce myself since I didn't do the, in the first place. Uh, my name is Ricardo Patino. I work at a communications firm here in Kuopio. I have lived in uh, Finland for eight years now, in Kuopio. <laughs> so I am a little bit of a sub line in myself. And I'm really glad to see this here because I am a witness of the incredible amount of talent that we have in this area. And to have a turnout on a science cafe like this, it's a privilege. So thank you for your time. I hope you guys had some good points to walk away with you and thank you to the professors especially for your time and your insight and all the research and the good work that you're doing to uh, facilitate us the prevention part the support part that we will need in the future as we get old as Pasi said or some of us will need that soon that's okay um, 
it gives me a little bit of peace of mind that there will be some support for me and my family. We appreciate your time and to be faithful to the Cafila time, to this cafe place, I dismiss you with a big applause for everybody. Thank you.